Thou shalt not steal. All right. <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right. Is that like time? Uh, the camera's on. We're recording. Good. Okay. Well, uh, we'll start with a prayer. This is the Anima Christi prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Soul of Christ, sanctify me. Body of Christ, save me. Blood of Christ, inebriate me. Water from the side of Christ, wash me. Passion of Christ, strengthen me. O good Jesus, hear me. Within thy wounds, hide me. Suffer me not to be separated from thee. From the malignant enemy, defend me. In the hour of my death, call me. And bid me to come to thee, that with thy saints I may praise thee forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Um, so, now you guys, I guess this is the second penance service you guys have been to. All right. Just remember that penance services, yeah. He almost, he almost made my joke for me. Just remember that penance services are not a substitute for actual confession, okay? You have to go to confession one-on-one -on -one with the priest and receive individual absolution after individually telling the priest your individual sins. And so just keep that in mind because uh, some people will try to fool you with the false idea that you can be absolved generally and that you need not confess your sins to a priest. But we all know as a result of this class that that is not true. We must receive individual absolution to have our sins forgiven. Also, you guys have like two days before your first confessions for those of you who aren't uh, going to be baptized Saturday, next Saturday. And so we'll all be praying for you that you have good confessions. I think Jerry is probably going to answer questions like that at the end, okay? Good question, though. <laughs> we'll make sure everyone knows where they're going here at the end. So just to, before Saturday, obviously, if you're going to be having your first confession, I've been talking about this for months now, but now is the time to really do a very thorough uh, examination of conscience and to make sure that you're ready for your confession. And uh, that fits in well with what we're talking about tonight, and that is the seventh commandment, which is thou shalt not steal. But just generally on these commandments, uh, we're talking about sin and the spiritual struggle that we all have against our passions. And the last time I talked, I think I talked about the passions and, and how we're constantly at war with them. We have to use our will to, and reason to subjugate the passions and to uh, basically wield control over ourselves and our sinfulness that we're always battling against as a result of original sin. And so I want to read this uh, short sentence from The Imitation of Christ by Thomas Akempis. And if you're not familiar with The Imitation of Christ, I would recommend it. Um, it's a very good book. What it has is very short little meditations uh, from St. Thomas Akempis. And uh, St. Therese of Lisieux said that this was the only book that she read. And she carried it around all the time. And it's said to be the second best-selling book of all time, or the second best, most important spiritual book of all time next to the Gospels and the Bible. And I think for large periods of church history after this book was written, people would basically read this instead of reading the Bible. It's a lot smaller. And so I want to read this, and this is from the section in Book 3, uh, paragraph 57, if you ever want to look at it. And this is uh, Christ speaking to uh, Thomas Akempis, who is not a Catholic saint for some reasons that we don't need to go into. But, um, but this is Christ speaking to him, and he's talking about... Um, not becoming too depressed when you slip into some fault or other. So he's talking about the spiritual warfare. And so he says, basically, uh, when you undergo affliction, when you're battling against your faults, don't imagine everything is lost just because you often find yourself in trouble or the prey of grave temptations. You are a man, not God, after all. No angel but flesh and blood. How do you think you could always stay in the same state of virtue when Lucifer in heaven couldn't do that or the first man in Eden? I am he who raises up and supports those who are in distress, lifting up to my Godhead those who are aware of their own weakness. And so as we talk about the commandments, we can have a tendency to get kind of uh, negative and um, legalistic about these things and 
Um, that kind of attitude tends toward focusing on the, the negative aspects of these sins. And uh, assuredly, there is a negative aspect. Thou shalt not kill. That's a negative commandment. Thou shalt not steal. That is a negative commandment. Uh, but there are positive aspects of these things too. And we should make sure that we never despair over our salvation, particularly when we, when we go to confession and have our sins forgiven. So we need to keep that in mind. Uh, because maintaining a positive outlook about God's uh, merciful providence uh, is just as important as recognizing how sinful we are. And that's the thing that saves us. Um, so keep that in mind as we talk about the seventh commandment tonight. So believe it or not, there's actually quite a bit of material to talk about for the seventh commandment. And I'm going to be stealing all, I, all that I talk about tonight from uh, my favorite book. It's called The Roman Catechism. And it's the Catechism of the Council of Trent. And I recommend that you read it. And, uh, you know, get this. This is a good book. And uh, so I'm basically going to steal this. So if you have a Roman catechism, follow along. James. All right. So the seventh commandment, thou shalt not steal. This is from Exodus. What are the benefits of this commandment? Well, when we talked about the fifth commandment, that was the not killing one, uh, the benefit there is that it sets a guard on our person. So we look at it as we shouldn't kill other people, but that's also a protection for us. It means that other people shouldn't kill us. The sixth commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery, sets a guard on our reputation. The seventh commandment sets a guard on our property and possessions. God forbids that our worldly goods, which are placed under his protection, uh, to be, that they are protected. They shouldn't be taken away or injured by anyone. We have a right to private property, in other words. And we thank God for this benefit that's conferred upon us by being faithful to his commandment. So the way that we repay other people for not murdering us is by not murdering other people, right? The way that we repay other people for not stealing from us is by not stealing from them. This is really the, the, the essence of the golden rule, if you really think about it. So there's two parts to this commandment, like there's two parts to every commandment, and that is the negative aspect and the positive aspect. The negative aspect deals with the expressly forbidden conduct of the commandment, that is theft. The positive aspect, keep on iPad, is, uh, deals with giving alms and that sort of thing. I'm going to talk about that toward the end. So the negative aspect. What's the negative aspect of thou shalt not steal? Stealing is forbidden. Okay, so what does it mean to steal? And I'm a lawyer, so I love these definitions. Oh, and I meant to use my joke about it's funny that a lawyer is teaching a class on not stealing. <laughs> I'll use that when I teach the class later on about not lying. Okay. Uh, when I saw the schedule months ago, I thought to myself, I'm going to make that joke, and then lo, these many months later, I forgot to make it. Okay, so stealing. What is stealing? We're going to talk a lot about definitions, but don't get too uh, worried about that. I'm not going to drop too much law knowledge on you all. Okay. Uh, but we need to understand what stealing is because I think that sometimes we think about, you know, I don't need to go in somebody's house and take their TV. Well, there's a little bit more to it than that, okay? Stealing is the taking away of anything from its rightful owner privately and without his consent. And it is also possession of that which belongs to another, contrary to the will, although not without the knowledge of the true owner. So that would include things like extortion. In uh, St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, he says extortioners shall not possess the kingdom of God. So extortion is uh, something that is encompassed by the Seventh Commandment. <coughs> robbery is also forbidden. I'm going to talk about the difference between robbery and theft because that's something that uh, non-lawyers might not necessarily pick up on. Robbery is actually a greater sin than theft because robbery involves basically taking somebody, something from somebody's immediate presence. Okay? We've got one guy here who was on a jury for us in an armed robbery case. He knows all about that. Um, it wasn't you, Nate. <laughs> but robbery not only deprives the, the uh, owner of their property, but it offers violence uh, and insult to the victim as well. Because taking something from someone, like if you come up and take my Roman catechism from me, I'm going to be hurt that you took my book mentally, but I'm also going to be hurt by you physically because you're going to have to rip it from my hands to take it from me, okay? So that's the difference between robbery and theft. So if I lay it there and I go away and you come take it, that's theft. If you take it from me, that's robbery. All right? So what are the various names of stealing? 
some of these are funny and some of these are antiquated. And you can tell that this was uh, from the Council of Trent, which was in the 16th century. So taking property from a private individual, that is theft. Taking property from the public is peculation. Enslaving a free man or appropriating another slave is man-stealing. <laughs> Stealing anything sacred is sacrilege. This would include things that are set aside for the necessary expense of divine worship, for the support of the ministers of religion, and for the use of the poor. So those are some names for stealing, okay? Um, so any questions so far? This is pretty rudimentary stuff so far. Good? Peculation. Yes, something like that. Uh, yeah, for sale sign. All right. So as with all the commandments, we know because Christ has told us, not only is the conduct sinful, uh, but the desire to commit the conduct is also sinful. So the desire to steal is forbidden. And that makes sense because this kind of gets into the later commandments about coveting things and jealousy of, one, of someone else's property. The will and desire to steal are also forbidden because the law is spiritual and concerns the soul. So it's not just dealing with our actions like the, like the civil law would, uh, but it deals with our internal dispositions as well because it deals with our souls. In the Gospel of St. Matthew, we hear that from the heart come forth evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, and false testimonies. And so we have this testimony from our God telling us that the, sin, that the thought of stealing is equally sinful. Now, all violations of the commandments we know are grave matter. Right? So when you're doing your examination of conscience, typically where you'll start is by thinking about, you know, have you violated the Ten Commandments? Because those are the things that are going to be the most grave. So what is the gravity of the sin of stealing? Natural reason tells us that theft is a violation of justice, and that is the justice which gives every man his own property. We have a right to our private property. The distribution and allotment of property is inviolable. This involves the law of nations and is confirmed by human and divine laws. Everyone is entitled to secure possession of what justly belongs to him for the good of human society. So the prohibition against stealing benefits everyone in society. So this raises an interesting question. What about governmental systems like communism and socialism that seek to take away private property, put it into the public trust, and then redistribute it? Pope Leo XIII in 1878 issued an encyclical called Quad Apostolici Muneris on the evils of socialism. This is a long quote, but it's not as long as the quote I'm going to read you later in this class from this encyclical. But this is Pope Leo XIII in 1878. And listen to what he says here, because this is just as pertinent now as it was when he wrote it. He who created and governs all things has, in his wise providence, appointed that the things which are lowest should attain their ends by those which are intermediate, and these again by the highest. Thus as even in the kingdom of heaven he hath willed that the choirs of angels be distinct and some subject to others, and also in the church has instituted various orders and a diversity of offices, so that all are not apostles or doctors or pastors, so also has he appointed that there should be various orders in civil society, differing in dignity, rights, and power, whereby the state, like the church, should be one body consisting of many members, some nobler than others, but all necessary to each other and solicitous for the common good. What does that mean? That means that the different class stratifications that we have in the world are instituted by God, the creator of all things. And so we cannot support a system of government which seeks to make everybody equal by the redistribution of private property. Therefore, communism and socialism are anti-Catholic ideas. Anybody have any questions about that? Right. Of the community. So that's different from taking away from somebody else. Right? Yes, and we're going to talk about that almsgiving later on in, tonight. So in this case, um, communism would violate the commandment. 
Yes, communism would violate the Seventh Commandment. Yeah. So would socialism. Yeah. And um, what's that? They do take. The government has a right. Now, that's, this is a little bit different because the government has a right to exact taxes from us. How do we know that? Because Christ himself told us that. Render unto Caesar, right? So the, right. And so the government has a right to appropriate taxes to keep governmental systems intact. The government doesn't have a right to appropriate private property to redistribute it to those people who don't have it. So there's a difference there. So insofar as the government takes private property to just give it away to somebody else who hasn't earned it, then that would be violative of the Seventh Commandment. Now, when the government does that, which the government assuredly does, there's a question about how culpable we are in the government's sinfulness there. In this case, because we can't do an evil to bring about a good, right? We can't do one evil to avoid another evil. We know that we have to render taxes to Caesar. Uh, we can't not pay taxes in order to avoid our tax dollars going to fund things that we don't agree with. The best example of this would be uh, when our tax dollars go to fund abortion and contraception, which they are now assuredly going to do, aren't they? We can't simply stop paying the government what is its due because portions of our money are going to fund things that we don't agree with. So there are competing interests here. There is a difference between our form of government and a socialist, pure socialistic or pure communist government where the means of production would be economized by the government. <laughs> Right. We can't, we can't avoid that, though. You're, you can believe that if you want to. You're telling me. I pay my taxes. Very annoying. Anyway, so what are the chief kinds of stealing? We're going we're to come back and talk a little bit more about this idea of communism and socialism, because that's, frankly, more interesting to me than uh, the other thing. Okay, so chief kinds of stealing. Theft, first. We're going to break this up into theft and robbery. Theft. Those who buy stolen, there's a bunch of different types of theft. That's what I'm going to talk about here. Those who buy stolen goods or retain the property of others, whether found, seized, or pilfered, commit theft. St. Augustine says, if you have found and not restored, you have stolen. You what? If you have found and not restored, you have stolen. So if I'm walking down the street and I find uh, your wallet and I don't give it back to you, I've stolen it. If the true owner cannot be discovered, whatever is found should go to the poor. But this doesn't apply to unappropriated things, okay? So say you're like a metal detector person who uses a metal detector on the seashore and you find some precious gem. Not, a, not in the form of a ring, but just a gem or something like that. I don't know. I don't find stuff. Uh, but say you found something like that, something that had never belonged to anyone. You could keep that. You don't have to give that to the poor. But if you find some sort of like an engagement ring or something like that, uh, but you just, there's no way you could tell whose it was, um, then you may consider donating, you know, selling that and donating the proceeds to the poor. What I'm talking about here is set forth in uh, the Summa Theologica, second part of the second part, question 66, article 5, response to objection 2. And that's a pretty interesting portion of the Summa if you want to think about theft. If you need that citation, Come talk to me after class, and also get a better hobby. That thing, that was funny. Okay, all right. <laughs> so those who, in buying and selling, have recourse to fraud and lying, commit theft. So if someone is selling you something for an exorbitant price, or if they're lying to you about it, you know, like on eBay or Craigslist, I got this great TV. It's $100, and you go buy it, and you take it home, and you plug it in, and it works for five minutes, and it doesn't work anymore. They defrauded you, come to find out. They had it set up where it would, only, it would work for five minutes and you wouldn't be able to know that there was something wrong with it. They have committed theft. Selling bad or adulterated goods as real and genuine. Or defrauding purchasers by weight, measure, number, that sort of thing. So don't do that. Those are theft. Laborers who exact full wages from those to whom they have not given just and due labor violate the Seventh Commandment. 
So laziness at work violates the seventh commandment. It's a grave sin. So these are some of the things that you may not think about when you're doing your examination of conscience, but now I'm telling you so you know. Those who obtain money under the pretense of poverty are but deceitful words. So the guy on the street corner who's like, I'm homeless, give me a dollar. And you give him a dollar, but he lives in a mansion down wherever the mansions are making. That guy is committing theft because he's lying to you. Those charged with offices of public or private trust who neglect or indifferently perform their duties while enjoying the salary of their office. So those people. Not going to name any examples? All right. So those are different forms of theft. Okay? Now, any questions so far? No? Good. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get to that. I'm gonna talk about that. I'm gonna talk about that kind of issue at the end, actually. Yeah. It could be, yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you're a poor person, and you're walking down the street, you find hundred bucks. I think, good for you. Yeah, I think in that case you're probably okay. Yeah. Mark, you mentioned um, not not offering up the work, but collecting the full wage. It seemed like in the section they also mentioned the reverse. So yeah, I'm going to talk about that. Okay, That's actually that robbery. Yeah. Oh, okay. I got you. Yeah, good question. Yeah, because that we see that a lot too. Yeah, that's a great question. So let's talk about robbery. Okay. Uh, robbery. Here it is. First, those who pay not the laborer his hire, rob from that person. Okay. Um, so if you work a job where you get underpaid, drastically underpaid, like I do, uh, my employer is robbing from me because they're making me work. And they're not paying me enough. I believe all our employers in here are robbing from us. <laughs> hey, you're like a general manager. You are the robber. No, anyway. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay. So those who do not pay or who turn to other uses or appropriate to themselves customs, taxes, tithes, and such revenues owed to church or civil authorities. And usurers, those who exact a crazy uh, amount of interest. Now, in Georgia, we actually have anti-usury laws. Uh, because, you know, I don't, I don't know how many of you have had lawsuits, but if you have like a lawsuit pending or something like that, you'll have people who will offer you, like, I will go ahead and pay you what, you, what I think you might get in your settlement if you uh, give me some kind of crazy amount of interest on that. So charging a crazy amount of interest, like, uh, like the payday lending places, they'll give you an advance on your payday or your title to your car or whatever, but they'll charge you like a ridiculous amount of interest. Uh, those people are usurers and they're even though they may not be violating the Georgia law, probably violating the Seventh Commandment. Now this one, I've never met anybody like this. Corrupt judges uh, and others who take bribes against the claims of the poor and the needy. We don't have anyone like that in Macon. Those who defraud their creditors and deny their just debts. We have a lot of people like this in, in America now, don't we? People who have credit card debt and they just don't pay it. People who... I'm not talking about people who run up credit card debt and then they get into a bind and they can't, okay? I'm talking, yeah, I'm not talking about you, Nate. I'm but talking about people who... Our interest is like stealing from us so that we can't pay our debt. It might be, or it might be something that you agreed to in advance. No. So, yeah. That's different. That would be theft. Because I've had things ordered on mine and sent to another street. Yeah, that would be theft. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, if you know that you know, if you know you're never going to have money, money, right, like me, you're, just, you're never going to have money, you can't really charge stuff. you got to not buy stuff on credit. It's just a really fancy way, or not so fancy way, of stealing. I had money to pay mom, so you didn't realize that you were never going to get that money, and now you already charged that. Right, that's why, that's why I think there's a difference here. We're talking about a situation where when you do that, you know that you're not going to pay for it, which that's pretty clearly theft, right? Yeah. No, I think that that is just a realization that they've probably charged you too high an interest rate. <laughs> All right. So like for me, for example, I have uh, what I estimate to be $786,000 in law school loans. And so, I'm kidding about that. <laughs> but they are high, okay. Um, it feels like that much. It feels oppressive like that. Um, but if I just stop paying those, I mean, that is a lawful debt that they have. And at this point, thank God, I have enough money to pay for that. But if I just decided I just don't want to, 
and believe me, I don't. And so I didn't. That would be theft. Because they, they have a, I have a lawful debt with them. I owe it to them to pay them. And so if I didn't, that would be sinful. Okay. Uh, the rich who exact with rigor what they lend to the poor, even though the latter are not able to pay them, and who disregarding God's law take as security even the necessary clothing of the unfortunate debtors. That's kind of like people who enslave others to a certain extent. Uh, people who, who lord it over people, uh, the, the work that they are supposed to give. And finally, and I expect we'll be seeing these people soon, uh, those who in times of scarcity hoard supplies. So all those people who were looking for Y2K to happen uh, and hoarding up, the Roman Catechism actually says corn. Uh, so the people for Y2K were hoarding up corn uh, in order to, I don't know what they were going to do with it. Make cornbread. <laughs> yes, yeah. And that's actually against various civil laws too, like... If uh, we enter into some sort of war that adversely affects our gas prices, and all the gas stations recognize that, and so the gas station down the block, seeing this coming, uh, starts to charge eight dollars a, ga a gallon for gas when the demand does not actually equal that, uh, the supply chain, they are violating the Seventh Commandment. All right. So we've talked about the negative aspects of the Seventh Commandment. Don't steal stuff. Yes, I, to I stole this from the Roman Catechism. <laughs> All right. Let's talk about the positive aspect, which I am likewise going to steal from the Roman Catechism. <laughs> this is the kindliness and liberality to neighbor. Now, I know that Gene turned his ears off when I heard the word liberality, uh, but I'm going to talk about this in a true Catholic sense, okay? Liberality. Now, the first thing to keep in mind is when you go to confess a violation of the Seventh Commandment, Restitution is required for the forgiveness of the sin. But who is required to pay restitution? Well, let me say this. Without restitution, the sin is not forgiven. So, who is bound by the obligation to pay restitution for sins of theft? Not only the one committing the theft, but all who cooperate in the sin. So, those who order others to steal, those who persuade or encourage others to steal, those who consent to the theft committed by others, those who are accomplices in and derive gain from the theft, those who have it in their power to prevent theft, who fully and freely suffer or sanction its commissions, those who are well aware theft is being committed but do not mention it and pretend they know nothing of it, all who assist in the accomplishment of theft, who guard, defend, receive, or harbor thieves. All these people are bound to make restitution to those from whom anything is stolen. And this includes children who steal from their parents and wives or husbands who steal from their husbands or wives. Everyone is bound to make restitution. That's part of the... <laughs> what I can say is that I've never been an eyewitness to the theft, and so I don't know that any of my clients have committed theft. Well, they, they are someone who is alleged to have committed a theft. I don't necessarily trust their truthfulness. So, um, we know that... See, I actually knew someone was going to ask me that, so I thought about this last night. How am I going to answer that question? Uh, but you're still bound to I am. Uh, and I think that... Uh, yeah, I can't do that. Yeah, if he pleads guilty, yeah. There's a difference in the civil law between... No, no, there, there's no, nothing about the criminal law in the United States deals with truth in any sort of meaningful way. So... No, and no one can force me to. <laughs> now, actually, I'll be honest with you guys. I don't represent a whole lot of people who steal stuff. Um, up until very recently, I was representing people in drug cases, and now I represent people who do more serious things, like murder and rape and that sort of thing. Um, I personally don't really like to represent people who have stolen or are alleged to have stolen stuff. They're, they are a different sort of people that are much more difficult to deal with, in my opinion, than drug addicts and people who shoot at other people. Uh, they're a very special breed of person, I think, because I think that there's something different about uh, stealing than there is about, you know, habitual drug use, for example, or even shooting at someone else. I think we can all understand the sort of anger that might trigger you to shoot at somebody else. But for 
the fact that I haven't had a gun on certain occasions, that's been the thing that has prevented me from shooting at someone else. I think we can all identify with that sort of heated temper before it calms down, okay? And drug people, they're people who have serious problems. People who steal stuff, and I've represented a lot of them, habitually steal stuff, and they just don't stop stealing stuff. And it's really annoying because I just want to tell them, stop breaking into people's houses and stealing stuff. Just stop. Drug people can't stop that. You may or may not be able to control your anger in any given moment. But people who just walk down the street and break into someone else's house, there's a very clear moral component involved there, and I personally don't like to represent people who steal stuff. But one day they'll break into the house of one of those people you were talking about to shoot people. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. So that's my personal take on it. Yeah. Yeah. To, to, in some cases, there's a there's a mental compulsion there. I don't understand it. I don't have a whole lot of sympathy for it. So again, in that situation, though, there you are with the thief sitting across from you, representing the thief. He confesses he stole. The thief says he's not going to plead guilty. He's compelled to defend him by the fact he's having undertaken the representation. Are you saying that under the definition you just gave us, guilty of the crime? No, I don't think so, because my job is really uh, not to necessarily prove that he didn't do it. My job is to, is to test the state's evidence to see if they can prove that he did it. And I think that that's a very meaningful distinction in any case where you're defending people. Uh, it may not seem meaningful to you all, but that's the, really the difference uh, in our system. So. Good question. The, yeah. your, your idea that thieves are a different sort of breed. Um, I'm a high school teacher, so cheaters. Yeah. And cheating, I would say, of all the seven cents, I think that falls more into stealing than lying because. Yeah. In a way. Yeah. And and there is something, um, and I've known I've known people that steal too, and they have to cultivate a personality of being a sneaky liar all the time, so they can get the opportunity to steal. Yeah. And. It's, and I, I, I had a shoplifting problem for like a couple of years. <laughs> it was on my list. I got my list. It <laughs> um, and the only thing that stopped me was I got caught and got put back in a police car and got scared the crap out of. And, yeah. and that made me realize, ooh, that's worse than the anxiety from stealing. And, yeah. Some it, people that works, yeah. <laughs> so I just, you know, like with drug addicts, the pro, like we all know somebody who's gotten gone down that road. But when you are dealing with a stealer and they steal, they're going to lie about everything else. Yeah. And so it's just, I see what you're saying. It's an interesting way to put it. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not a psychologist or a psychiatrist. I'm talking about my experience having represented uh, about uh, 1,100 criminal defendants. That's just my experience. All right, so let's talk about not many of them thieves, thankfully. I'd rather represent a child molester than a burglar. Anyway, um, alms deeds. This is the positive aspects of this commandment. Alms deeds, okay? What? Alms deeds, alms giving. This is important during the time of Lent, isn't it? Right? We're supposed to be practicing prayer, fasting, and alms giving. And um, so, seventh commandment, alms deeds. The seventh commandment implies an obligation to sympathize with the poor and needy. God will condemn those who have omitted and neglected the duty of alms giving. Those who are unable to give should at least lend to the poor what they need to sustain life. And so let's think about this in the wider scope of, of our you know, system of government, where we have a system of government at this point who's trying to impose on us an almsgiving, if you will, uh, from a governmental perspective. That's not Catholic teaching. So again, and this is a longer quote from Leo XIII, Quad Apostolici Humanaris, 1878. While the, excuse me, while the socialists would destroy the right of property, alleging it to be a human invention, altogether opposed to the inborn equality of man, and claiming a community of goods, argue that poverty should not be peaceably endured, and that the property and privileges of the rich may be rightly invaded, the church, with, with much greater wisdom and good sense, recognizes the inequality among men who are born with different powers of body and mind. Inequality in actual possession also and holds that the right of property and of ownership, which springs from nature itself, must not be touched and stands inviolate. 
For she knows that stealing and robbery were forbidden in a so special a manner by God, the author and defender of right, that he would not allow man even to desire what belonged to another, and that thieves and despoilers, no less than adulterers and idolaters, are shut out from the kingdom of heaven. But not the less on this account does our Holy Mother not neglect the care of the poor or omit to provide for their necessities, but rather drawing them to her with the mother's embrace and knowing that they bear the person of Christ himself, who regards the smallest gift of the poor as a benefit conferred on himself, holds them in great honor. She does all she can to help them. She provides homes and hospitals where they may be received, nourished, and cared for by all, <coughs> cared for all the world over and watches over these. She is constantly pressing on the rich that most grave precept to give what remains to the poor, and she holds over their heads the divine sentence that unless they succor the needy, they will be repaid by eternal torments. In fine, she does all she can to relieve and comfort the poor, either by holding up to them the example of Christ, who being rich became poor for our sake, or by reminding them of his own words, wherein he pronounced the poor blessed, and bade them hope for the reward of eternal bliss. But who does not see that this is the best method of arranging the old struggle between the rich and poor? For as the very evidence of facts and events shows, if this method is rejected or disregarded, one of two things must occur. Either the great portion of the human race will fall back into the vile condition of slavery, which so long prevailed among the pagan nations, or human society must continue to be disturbed by constant eruptions, to be disgraced by rapine and strife, as we have had sad witness even in recent times. And so what is Pope Leo XIII saying? Class distributions are God-made. Some people are smart, some people are not. Some people are rich, some people are poor. Some people are industrious, and some people are not. It is not the duty of government to make everybody equal. It is the duty of the rich to provide for the poor. And so the church teaching is not that government should sort all this out and give stuff to the poor people. The church teaching is that the rich should be admonished that their failure to share what they have will resort in their being condemned to hell. That is the way of peace, and that's what the church teaches. And the church is above the government. Any questions about that? We're sitting here who believe in an absolute law, a natural law, foundation, ten commandments, etc., which are all part of that. And we're living in a society that is relativistic, that makes up its own law, <coughs> because they think that's the way it ought to be. Anyone can see that, that one is disastrous towards the other, but it also puts us in a very precarious position, because that temptation is even greater uh, to fall into Well, the, yes, relativism springs from the idea called materialism. And that is that we can somehow, through human effort, create a utopian <coughs> society on Earth, if only everybody were equal. And you can see that that assumes a lot of things that are just never going to happen. Never, never is everyone going to be equal. And we can't make that happen. And we certainly can't do it by human means. And so the church is teaching, as, as is the church's purview, that the more that the utopia is in heaven. And so the more important task for us is to make sure that everybody is in a position where they can get to heaven. And so the worst thing in life is not to be poor. The worst thing in life is to not accept your plight, as Christ did, right? So that's what Leo XIII is getting at here, saying that the... You know, the poor should endure their state in life and the rich should try to help them. Okay? I, I, uh, <clears throat> I tell a lot of my liberal friends, find me a place in the New Testament where Jesus or Paul speaks against slavery, 
where they talk about social justice, where they talk about equality, or where they talk about class. They don't. You won't find them. They do not. In fact, I love to remind them that if Jesus or Paul were here today, or had Jesus or Paul been here in the 60s during all the civil rights hoopla, they may well have said, hey, accept your lot and love your neighbor and worship God in spirit and in truth. If Jesus or Paul had been here in the 1850s during the slave era, they very likely would have told the slaves, hey, look, this is your lot. You accept it, you worship God, and you love your fellow man. Well, this drives people up the wall today to hear this, but the fact is, if you read your Bible, you will not find any of that in there. Now, we draw all kinds of implications from what we think the Bible says, and we often end up reading between the lines. But, you know, the Bible is not a textbook for socialism or egalitarianism or social justice or any of that nonsense that you hear spouted and that the schools are full of. So, you know, keep the thought. And before we end this little foray into socialism, let me quote uh, Pope Pius XI. This is an encyclical called Quadragesimo Anno, 1931. Catholic and socialists have contradictory meanings. But if socialism, as all errors, contains some truth in itself, which, what is that truth? That truth is that we should care for the poor, right? That's the truth that socialism contains. Which, indeed, the sovereign pontiffs have never denied. Popes have never denied that socialism contains that kernel of truth. Nevertheless, it is based on a doctrine of human society peculiar to itself and at odds with true Christianity. Religious socialism, Christian socialism have contradictory meanings. No one can at the same time be a good Catholic and a socialist in the true sense of the word. All right. No socialism. Seventh Commandment. So, what are the other positive aspects of the Seventh Commandment? Frugality. We should practice frugality and draw sparingly on the kindness of others. All right, that was kind of an anticlimactic ending. Let me talk about the punishments for the violating the Seventh Commandment. It can, this is a quote from the Roman Catechism, from which I am stealing. It cannot be doubted that such crimes are the seeds from which have sprung in great part the evils which in our times oppress society. I mean, come on, right? This is in the 16th century. They're writing this amazing, because it's true now. No, it doesn't. Neither does truth, which is why we can use this catechism instead of the current catechism. <laughs> God makes awful threats against those who violate this commandment, but great promises to those who act out of generosity and kindness toward the poor and needy. So we have every uh, reason to not violate this and every other commandment. Let's talk about some of the excuses that people make for violating this commandment. And this is where we're going to get into some of these kind of specific examples. The Roman Catechism says that their excuses, far from extenuating, serve only greatly to aggravate their guilt. And so these are some of the excuses for stealing that the Roman Catechism talks about. The plea of rank and position. These are those who take what belongs to others from a desire to maintain the grandeur of their families and their ancestors. Uh, the catechism suggests that kings should be dethroned rather than to violate God's will and commandments. We can see this in a little bit in our society with governments and uh, our aristocracy, uh, large corporations who would rather steal from their employees and from their shareholders uh, than to risk their reputation. I think, that's, I think we'd probably see that on a smaller local personal level too. I mean, yeah. yeah, yeah, we have... Uh, 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 aristocracy who will do anything to maintain their position. The plea of greater ease and elegance. Those who desire greater ease and elegance. Pretty simple, right? You can't steal from other people just because it's easier for you. <laughs> the plea of others' wealth. I have a note to read this. We'll find, plea of others' wealth. We do not, but do we not sometimes hear the thief contend that he is not guilty of sin because he steals from the rich and the wealthy, who in his mind not only suffer no injury, but do not even feel the loss? Such an excuse is as wretched as it is baneful. You can't steal from people just because they're rich. It's because they have more than you have. That doesn't mean you can steal from them. You can't steal from Microsoft just because they have a bunch of money. And think about that in terms of stealing uh, music from recording companies. Now, one can 
suggest that the recording companies are violating the Seventh Commandment by doing a disservice to their recording artists, but didn't those people sign those contracts? And so just because we perceive the system to be unfair doesn't mean that we can write the system by stealing from them. And so if you stole music, confess that on Saturday. Bootlegging movies is a good example. Very good example. The plea of force of habit. You can't steal just because it's a habit. I've talked about this every time I've talked, right? You cannot excuse your sinfulness by saying, I just always do that. You can't say, oh, it's just my habit, that's my character. No, that is your sinfulness, fight it. In Ephesians, we hear it said, He that stole, let him now steal no more. They were accustomed to steal. Let them recollect that one day they will become accustomed to an enormity of torments. <laughs> you got it. Here's a funny one, and I can't even believe they had to address this. The plea of favorable opportunity. You can't steal just because, you know, it's easy at the moment. Uh, but then you think about it a little bit more, and it, it gets into this. It is our duty to resist every evil at every moment. Um, and so we have to be on guard, right? This is why we have to subject our passion to our, our uh, will and intellect. I think favorable opportunity is probably one of the most tempting reasons to steal. Uh, it is, yes, yeah. I mean, we all do that, right? Think about this in relationship to the things I was talking about in terms of laziness at work. Office supplies. Office supplies. Very good example there. Those are sins that need to be confessed because they are grave matter because they violate the Seventh Commandment. All right, restitution. Let's say you stole a hunk of office supplies and yes. you get a confession and like, I have this stapler and these index cards or whatever, mm -hmm. this computer or whatever. Um, <laughs> a Ferrari. It's all theft, right? Yeah. Um, and the rest, and so are we supposed to go to our boss and be like, um, a, you know, or... If your confessor had you do that, maybe, okay? Uh -huh. Um, I think most confessors would not have you do that as part of your penance because they know that you would lose your job. However, there's this principle called the thing cries out for its owner, okay? Which means that if it can be replaced, you have to replace it. If it cannot be replaced, you should donate similar value to the poor. Nope. Even if they're employees, they don't feel like, they feel like that's those two. Right. But it, is, but it is stealing. This is why we have, to, we, have to, we have to polish our consciences so that we can recognize these sins. <laughs> to say that you do not sin because you have no opportunity of sinning is almost to acknowledge that you are always prepared to sin when opportunity offers. All right. And here's another one. I think we just talked about this. The plea of revenge. Those who steal because they have been stolen from. You cannot return injury for injury. You can't judge your own cause. No one can punish one man for the wrong done from another. So if you steal from me, I can't then be like, Kelly stole from me. Gene, I'm taking your truck. <laughs> <laughs> if someone takes something that's yours and you steal, I mean, it's not like you're going to go back. Yes, you can take it back. No. You have a claim of right because that's your property. So what? They stole from you. You could do that. Uh, you could do that if you wanted to. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. What about if it's a case of you're stealing something? I'm not just. I'm not saying that I did this. I'm not saying that right now. What if you're ripping off something that already done been stolen? Like, like, it's like old Robin Hood did. You know, this guy stealing from the poor people that are taking all this stuff, beating them out of it, robbing, as you said. And he's ripping them off and redistributing it. No. <laughs> it's not our responsibility to equalize things. We have no um, right to equalize things like that. That's not our responsibility. It's no one's responsibility because we don't have a right for things to be equal. Didn't you hear these encyclicals from Leo the Thirteenth? Don't need to read. Them? Okay. okay Mark, um, yeah. The rich, like, um, let's say that they're they uh, they acquire their wealth through doing things that are bad to society, and their power is accumulating. And I'm 
I'm thinking of the Robin Hood stories, but I'm also thinking corporate America. Yeah. Like, is it, you know, if justice is not being done, is, is it, would breaking down their system through, through theft and through these mal malicious ways, if you did indeed, you talk about restitution, if you yeah. did indeed. So, um, a socialist, or is that, I mean, trying to break down the, the man, you know. No, I, I think that you're, what you're getting into here is the idea of rebelling against an unjust system, mm -hmm. which is okay. Um, as long as you're using proportionate sort of ideas, okay? So a, fighting a revolution against a, a, an unjust government, for example, is okay. That's allowed. You can do that. People but If they make three, four, five million dollars a year, people need to understand that is not money out of mine and your pockets. That ain't how the economy works. That's not how finance works. It doesn't, I don't care how much the CEO of Southern Company makes because it's not money out of my pocket. It's not money out of your pocket. It's not money out of Jesse Jackson's pocket or anybody else's pocket who yells and hollers, Obama's pocket who yells and hollers and screams, they're idiots, they don't understand economics, and they do not understand finance, and I get sick of hearing it. It ain't money out of your pocket, folks. But I think CEO of Southern Country makes $5 million a year. Sorry. Now, the way I interpreted your question, though, you are asking, what about uh, situations where corporations are doing things that are illegal? They are gaining means illegally, essentially. If they do it illegally, that's right. different. And so, in our, we have a unique situation, I don't think this has ever happened in, in human history, where the government has propped up corporations to the extent that the government is essentially complicit in their theft. I think in that case, I think we would be justified in revolting against our government for many reasons, aside from that one at this point, but uh, I would agree in political science. So let's just talk about theology here. Viva la revolution. Are we ready? Let's do it. Well, I was listening to a talk from a bishop earlier today on this, uh, you know, he was talking about the idea that with it, no Catholicism, no peace. I mean, in, in a country where everybody was Catholic, there would be peace. In countries where that's not the case, that is not the case. Uh, and so we have an unjust world. We live in an unjust world. But we have to realize, right, just like we don't have a right to go to heaven, we don't have a right to live in a just world. What we're supposed to do is to deal with that, because that's part of the suffering, right? That's part of our cross. Our cross is that we live in 21st? Yeah, 21st. We live in 21st century America, where stuff ain't fair. We have corporations that do bad things, and governments that do stupid stuff. And that's our cross. Yeah. The, okay, the last, last uh, excuse is the plea of financial embarrassment. Uh, those overwhelmed with debt that cannot be paid off otherwise. So, no debt presses more heavily upon all men than that which we say in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our debts. It is folly to increase our debt to God by sin to pay our debts to men. So we can't steal from somebody else to pay our debt, right? Because we can't commit a sin against God in order to satisfy a debt to some other person. And so I want to end, yes, by talking about uh, the Jean Valjean situation, which I'm surprised that none of you have talked about, and that is, what if I'm so poor I've got to go steal a loaf of bread to feed my family? Okay. If you look at the Summa Theologica, second part of the second part, question 66, article 7, here's what it says. If the need be so manifest and urgent that it is evident that the present need must, must be remedied by whatever means be at hand, for instance, when a person is in some imminent danger and there is no other possible remedy, then it is lawful for a man to succor his own need by means of another's property by taking it either openly or secretly, nor is this properly speaking theft or robbery. So there has to be an imminent danger and no other possible remedy. So I'm about to die right now unless I eat some bread. And none of you will give me some bread. I've got to take a cookie from you. Well, we've seen people, I've seen a family on the side of the road and they ask for money because they, they're from out of town and they, their car's broke and they need money and the kids need to be fed. Well, my mother ran across some and, and this man, and they offered to take them anywhere they wanted to, to eat, and they didn't want it. All they wanted was the money. 
Yes, well, many people are dishonest, aren't they? <laughs> right. All right. Sweet. They figured that's what he wanted. And also, the guy in Bacon that's what he had that and has a, has a $150,000 home, but he mm -hmm. says on the side of the street saying he worked for his poor. Yeah, that guy's in every city. He always makes it in the paper. Okay, so any questions about, any other questions about the seventh commandment? Okay, um, as far as rich and poor goes, how do we know where that line is? I mean, <laughs> I don't think that we do know where that line is. I think it's up for me. I don't think that it matters. <laughs> uh, like yeah. It's a matter of it's difficult for me to pay my bills, or it's difficult for me to eat, or it's difficult for me to keep my kid in private school, or it's difficult for me to pay for my Escalade. You know what I mean? I like, think it would be different things to different people. Honestly, I do. Middle so I guess our job as Catholics is to sort of gauge where we are at. And okay, let's yeah. say okay, for example, let's say that I live under the poverty line, but then I see on the TV some little African children who are starving literally as a, their community is starving. Yeah. Relatively speaking, I've got it made. I live in America. Right. Yeah. I'm on welfare or whatever I am. I'm, you know, so I'm poor in my community, but I'm not poor in the worldwide community. Does that mean I'm responsible for a certain amount of giving to the poor? I think so. Let me, uh, since we're talking about alms giving a little bit, let me say something about that, though. Um, we don't have an obligation to give money to that guy who's, who hits us up after Mass because he's playing on our sense of religious obligation. Okay? We don't have that obligation. We don't know if that guy really needs alms or not. Now, you don't do something wrong by giving that guy some money. Don't get me wrong. But you have no obligation to give that guy money. We have an obligation to support the church. The church does a lot of charitable things, right? We have religious sisters and brothers who take care of our almsgiving responsibilities for us. At least we should have that. And we should support those groups of people. So we don't necessarily have an individual responsibility to do that ourselves, although those, that sort of thing would be a corporal work of mercy. We do have an obligation to give towards those things, though. So I would say that if you see the little uh, African village on TV, I would not give to them. I would find a Catholic charity. I would, yeah, I would find a Catholic charity. I don't want to get into that. That's too, yeah, that's well, math. We have the rice bowl that the church gave us. Yeah, you could do something like that. To yeah. put our little yeah. change in to bring right. it. To right. Church. And I, I say that because you want to be sure that your almsgiving is going somewhere useful. And so you would, generally speaking, give through the church. Now, you would also do things like, you know, work at a soup kitchen or something like that. Corporal work of mercy there to tend to the poor. Um, but, yeah, that's, that's kind of, you know, you have to use common sense there. And remember, the intention counts for a lot of things here. Um, you know, because you, you never know. I guess oh, wait, wait, wait. She had her hand up first. Sorry. started bringing things to the land and we, we basically filled up our blood donor room with furniture and clothing and everything plus presents for the children and all this kind of stuff. It took five trucks by the time we were done. Wow. We met the woman over in East Macon. They found her a two bedroom, uh, you know, one of those older red brick houses. Had a we showed up with five trucks her apartment from the kitchen table to the bed to the mattresses and box springs or anything. Uh, furniture, a working TV. The mother ended up with new cookware for the kitchen, tiles, linen. The children had new toys for Christmas. We completely outfitted their entire house. Two, the, the following Christmas, uh, and 
they got the, they helped this woman find a job. The following huh? Christmas, so about a year later, we called back at the BFAX office to follow up to see what had happened. She not only started a part-time job, but went back to school. And within a year, she was in school at that time, and a year after that, graduated at the top of her class as a nurse. Yep. <laughs> Yeah. You never know how you're going to impact somebody. The rich poor, if you're asking the rich poor thing, it, it is very relevant. Back in the day, you know, the big millionaires, J.P. Morgan, John D. Rockefeller, the newspaper reported with J.P. He earned a ton of money. He uh, said, what's the Pope? He said, you know, when he's getting ready to retire, so what do I do? He says, well, you need to confess it. And I forgive him. And his penance was to give it all back. So Cosimo de' Medici gave back the arts for Florence. Well, we know Florence has had so many beautiful artwork and things and, and, and stuff because he gave back every single dime that he earned from usury back into society. So you see, benefit the poor, the rich also can benefit from the same kind of forgiveness and, and retribution, which is a benefit for all of mankind. Yeah. So you see, it, it, it affects everybody, no matter what your social class is, just what your status is. Was that before or after the Crusades? No, after. After? after. after. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Well, within, within the Knights Templar, we're doing the exact same thing. They called it usage. They said, no, it's not in print. And, and they, they were given a pass for doing the exact same thing. Let's not get into historical debate. We've got another question here. Oh, I was just, um, when um, Kelly was asking her question, um, the thing that was going through my mind was not so much rich versus very rich or poor versus very poor, but rather something that, would hit a little closer to home for me in terms of having an obligation to give according to my means. Yeah. You know, not, not having a cop out saying, oh, well, I can't give uh, alms this month or this week because I want this new cell phone. Or, I, you know, I can't give that much because I've decided I want to you know, take a trip somewhere. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we can't be so consumed with material goods for ourselves that we neglect our obligation to, to give alms and to support the church. Right. Yeah, that's kind of the, the rule. So that's kind of what I was hearing when, when yeah. you were asking that but, question. But if one is monetarily strapped, you have time and talent. That's part of what mm -hmm. you can give, which has a value. And, you know, what we have to offer. Yeah, well, that's where we talk about the corporal works of mercy, yeah. Because I guess turn, turning that uh, dial a little further, I would imagine... The implication is not that you would have to give past your means necessary. Yeah. Right? You wouldn't have to sacrifice your own meal. Right. Yeah. Just yeah. That's that's a good point. And you think about these things are proportionate, right? We're talking about percentages here, not uh, fixed amounts, but percentages, which are obviously different for each person, they fluctuate with the person. So, any other questions about the seventh commandment? Okay. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I think you would need to, you know, only he can judge himself on that. I was, you know, God can judge him on that. I don't know. I would like to make that much money. Yeah. <laughs> I would use it wisely, Lord. <laughs> okay, anything else on the seventh commandment? Okay, so, uh, you know, you guys are all preparing for your first confessions this week, so make them count. And... Uh, you know, it's not very scary. Yeah, just, relax. <laughs> just relax. That'll be fine. Uh, just, you know, come prepared. The best thing you can do for a confession is to be prepared for it by accurately recounting your sins and to uh, focus on uh, contrition. Because confession is not valid unless you're contrite. So you have to be contrite. And so don't neglect the contrition aspect when listing your sins. And secondarily, I wanted to mention briefly, because this is the last time I will talk to you all before uh, you join the church, and that is these liturgies that we have coming up uh, are very important liturgies uh, for all of you and for the church as a whole. 
Sunday's liturgy is the uh, liturgy of Palm Sunday, and it begins with a procession of palms, and this recounts the Lord's triumphal entry into Jerusalem uh, just a few days before he was executed. And we will get a foretaste of that sort of, we'll, we'll get to experience that because we'll have a procession of palms before the Mass, and there'll be, you know, glorious singing and that sort of thing. And then during the Mass, we will have the Passion sung or chanted or read here uh, to us. And so we have a, the triumphal entry followed, you know, ten minutes later by the Passion Gospel. And so it's a powerful witness uh, to, to the dichotomy that was Christ as he entered Jerusalem and the way that people treated him. And we treat him like that all the time. We think about him in a very triumphal way, and then we will just as soon turn around and crucify him again with our sinfulness. So this is an important liturgy. Uh, and then next week, starting on Sunday, is Holy Week. And Holy Week is the, as the name indicates, holiest time of the year. And it is the last week of Lent. So it's the time for you all and for all of us to um, make our immediate preparations for uh, Easter. And so this would be the time to ramp up the prayer and fasting and almsgiving. If you're not fasting for Lent, I would suggest at least make Holy Week a fast, that would be one meal per day, and uh, on Fridays, no meat. Good Friday is a day of fasting and abstinence anyway. So consider that uh, for your Holy Week as you approach the joining, joining the church. Uh, Holy Tuesday, I think it is, there's a Chrism Mass in Savannah. Then Holy Thursday, there will be the Holy Thursday Mass, which commemorates the institution of the Eucharist. And so I advise you to come to all these liturgies. So that'll be a... Uh, a Mass, and that'll be the last Mass before Easter. Uh, and so that'll be the Mass that uh, commemorates the institution of the priesthood and the institution of the Eucharist. What about Good Friday? On Good Friday, there is what's called a Liturgy of the Presanctified. It is not a Mass. Um, the Liturgy of the Presanctified has the uh, consecrated hosts that were left over from the Holy Thursday Mass are distributed in a communion service, and it's a very somber Mass. There's a litany of prayers for uh, various intentions, for the conversions of various peoples, and uh, a lot of standing, kneeling, and that sort of thing. So from Holy Thursday up until the Easter Vigil, there's no uh, pomp, really, in the church. Uh, there is uh, no organ music, there's no bells, um, and there's no mass on Good Friday or, or Holy Saturday. Adoration the Adoration Chapel is closed Thursday. starting Thursday night. And Thursday night after the last Mass, there will be a uh, adoration in the church until midnight to commemorate uh, Christ's uh, agony in the Garden of Gethsemane. And so this is really where, um, you know, when our Lord asks, can you not spend one hour with me? You can, and it's Thursday night. So come to the church for adoration until midnight. Friday, Liturgy of the Presanctified, as I said, and then Saturday, there's no Mass anywhere in the world, uh, and uh, be good Catholics, and when you come into the church on Good Friday, or I'm sorry, on Saturday, don't be genuflecting toward the tabernacle, because Christ will be removed from the tabernacle on Thursday night, and so don't give bad example to everybody by genuflecting to an empty tabernacle. When Christ is not in the tabernacle, you bow towards the altar. Right. You can, you can notice that the light's on. Yeah. The light won't be there because he won't be there. Are you talking about the Saturday before Easter? Yes. Light. Okay. Yeah. obviously that changes? No. Yes. Yeah. yeah. At the consecration, yeah. Okay. So you'll notice when you come to Mass for the Easter Vigil on Saturday at 8, a whole bunch of really uninformed Catholics genuflecting before they get in their pews, and you can laugh at them and think to yourself, I know better than them their faith. Um, Palm Sunday, with the procession, where do we, the congregation, go at the beginning of Mass? You come into the church as normal, and then everyone will go to the front, outside, outside the front, so there if it's not raining. Out there yeah, the Father Madonna will come to the Ambo and tell everybody, make sure you get a poem and go up front. Uh, if we had another church close by, we would probably go there and then walk from that church to this church. Hmm. Not at Palm Sunday. Easter Vigil will be a whole different thing. Yes? Uh, no, this is a I don't know. Yeah. You know, Father McDonald said 
Okay, so no dismissal this Sunday. So stay for the whole Mass. You'll finally get the grace of staying at Mass. Twelve? I think there is a twelve at a procession at twelve and nine thirty. I think so, yeah. Yeah, I think there's I wanna say there's two. Come to the nine thirty, you'll be guaranteed a procession. Processions are very powerful and processions are very Catholic. We process around and we carry stuff. Sacramental. It's a sacramental. No, because you're not Catholic yet. You mean just because we profess we're not Catholic? No. I thought you said we were entering into the church. No. Easter vigils. Easter vigils when you enter the church. So even though you're going to confession this Saturday. You have to be holy to take the communion. Yes, but you also have to be Catholic. And that's the most holy day would be the day we took communion. You cannot receive communion until the Easter vigil. I believe they would, if they want to become Catholic. Okay, here's the other thing. All right, here's what the process is. Everybody listen carefully. You go to confession Saturday. This Saturday, you go to confession. At the Easter Vigil, for those of you who are not baptized, or for those of you who have already been baptized, you will be formally received in the church which is accomplished by making a profession of faith and a handshake with the priest. That's when you become Catholic. The confirmation doesn't make you Catholic. The handshake and the profession of faith make you Catholic. So just because you've confessed doesn't make you Catholic. Now I would note, you're going to confession this Saturday. You have a whole week there to sin. Confessions will be heard on Friday and Saturday. I recommend you avail yourselves of them, even if you haven't fallen in mortal sin, because you want to be in a good, you know, a good state when you join the church. Don't sin for a week. Now, uh, the reason that's not done is because Holy Saturday is a very busy day. Very, very busy. Okay, any questions about the, these liturgies? Come to all of them. And be Catholic. That's what we do.